So the Dark Anglo Japanese Foundation um, is a foundation that was founded in 1988 as a UK charity um, with a donation from this, the Diamond Capital Markets, which is a large um, investment firm in Japan. And the aim of the foundation is to support links between the UK and Japan. This is across a variety of industries and fields. Um, so the headquarters are in London, um, which, and at the headquarters, there's often loads of nice events on uh, different Japan Anglo um, topics. And you can also go and view some art at the foundation uh, and the, the addresses at the end of this presentation. Um, and th there are three main activities that the foundation carries out. And then what we're gonna talk about today is the scholarships, which is the flagship program. But the foundation also has grants uh, for individuals and small um, sort of co-ops companies. And that might be for um, research exchanges or for attending conferences and things like that. And like I said, the foundation also hosts events um, both online, uh, which you can find on the YouTube channel and <clears throat> um, in person, um, dependent on the, the COVID-19 situation. Um, so yes, today we're going to talk about mostly these Diary Scholarships, which is the first one, uh, which is a 19 month program where you study Japanese, um, you have a homestay with a Japanese family, and uh, you then have a work placement in a field related to your career goals. Uh, we do also, well the foundation also offers a scholarship in Japanese studies, and that's for people who have already studied Japanese um, and who want to continue studying Japanese at a postgrad level. Um, so if that applies to anyone here today, you probably won't be eligible for the Daira scholarships because um, there's a certain level of Japanese which you already have. Um, but in that case, you can apply for the Daira scholarships in Japanese studies, which is a separate program. Um, I'm gonna move this out of the way. Okay. Um, so the Daira scholarships um, have been running since 1991. And there's been a few kind of tweaks along the way as the world changes and feeding back um, from um, sort of feedback from previous scholars. But um, it's a 20 month program of which 19 are spent in Japan. Um, so there is an initial one month which you spend in the UK um, and then you head to Japan uh, for the rest of the program. And each year there's around eight scholars. It depends on the foundation and who's um, who they want to invite some years, there's, there's fewer, some years there's more, but you anticipate you'll have about eight scholars each year. Uh, and here are just some images um, of, I think the most recent scholars, so my year and uh, the year after me in Japan. Um, so the deadline for the 2022 applications is uh, the 2nd of December, 2021. Um, and the scholars who are successful, the applicants who are successful, sorry about this kind of bar that's in the way at the bottom here. Um, <clears throat> the applicants who are successful um, will be departing in September, 2022. Um, and then you'll be, you'll be finishing up graduating 19 months later. So the 30th of March, 2024. Um, and what the program covers is, as I said before, an initial one month placement um, in the UK. So this is at a language school uh, where you have a, a nice intense um, course in Japanese that will get you ready um, just to speak. When, so when you land in Japan, you have a good level of Japanese that you can get around um, prior to starting your sort of official full-time studies at Waseda. So that's your one month in the UK. It's at a language school called EJF. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then, so once you've finished your one month in the UK, you'll be heading to Japan in September um, for 12 months initially, uh, for, for, 18, for 19 months, sorry, but the first 12 months <clears throat> is full-time language studies at Waseda University. So it's a very <clears throat> reputable university. Um, you'll be studying Japanese full-time and it is an intense um, course, uh, but you do have the opportunity to join Waseda clubs and societies whilst you're there. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute as well. Um, so you have it first of all, you have 12 months learning Japanese, you then have a one month homestay and you, you have a choice uh, where you go in Japan, depending on if you want to visit any particular area or if there's any kind of activity that you particularly want to do. Um, the Daiwa Japan off the, the Tokyo office are really um, proactive in helping you to are really kind of supportive in helping you to find a homestay that suits your 
uh, goals. And you can say pretty much anywhere in Japan. And again, we'll talk about a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. And then after the homestay, you have another six months. And this is the work placement aspect of the program. Uh, normally, you'll be staying in Tokyo. Um, but if there's a reason that your work placement needs to be outside of Tokyo, that generally can be um, taken into consideration. And it's a six month work placement. This can either be six months in one place or sometimes, like, for example, I split mine up into two, three month placements. Um, so that's also an option. Um, and I suppose the work placement is something which you would want to consider in your application um, to the scholarship. But we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, but yeah, it's good. It's good to think about your placement um, whilst you're, you're doing your application um, so that the foundation understands what your career goals are. So the first um, aspect of the, of the scholarship uh, is this a four week course at EJF, which is a, a school, the Jap Euro Japanese Exchange Foundation, uh, which is a school in High Wycombe. And we go there as scholars to learn Japanese, but there's also Japanese students who are there to learn English. So it's a nice um, opportunity to practice Japanese whilst you're there with native speakers. So it's a four week, course it is intense um although like the uh, schedule says 9 to 3 30 and 9 to 2 15 uh, monday to friday you then all have lots of homework <laughs> um so it is an intense four weeks you have weekends off and the found the scholarship um, provides a stipend for this time so um you don't have to worry about living costs um but it is an intense four weeks so um yeah, be prepared to study. Uh, but the good thing is that then whether you've had no experience of Japanese before, whether you've had a little bit, um, hopefully after the four weeks, that means that you can get onto the plane to Tokyo with a bit of confidence that when you arrive, you at least be able to ask for like the bathroom and ask for different things at restaurants and stuff like that. Um, and in addition to the language studies, you also have um, some lectures in the evenings on different aspects of Japanese culture and history. Uh, and this um, this is a really nice opportunity as well to learn about sort of yeah cultural traditions that might be important when you arrive. Um, I think when I was there, we had a, like a real variety of talks. Some of them were like on environmental um, sort of programs in Japan. Uh, some were on the imperial uh, system, um, so like the emperor. And I think we had another talk on um, really simple cultural things. I think it was something to do with chopsticks. I can't remember like different um, <laughs> meanings of chopstick, um, sort of whether you have chopsticks flat or holding upright, there was kind of different meanings to it. So yeah, it, it's a fun um, cultural, but also language for uh, study for four weeks. And then you finish at EJF, I think you have a week or, week or so <laughs> to gather all your stuff. I should say um, this four weeks course, you'll be staying with a family in High Wycombe during this time. So you won't be commuting from your home or whatever. The foundation provides, um, uh, yeah, a family in the UK provides a room for you. So you'll be staying in High Wycombe for those four weeks. So then you'll have about a week or so, I think, um, to sort of sort out your stuff, say goodbye to your friends and family, and then you'll be heading to Japan. And you arrive in Tokyo and have a two weeks um, of accommodation sorted in a hotel. Um, and I think you, yeah, normally Kono-san at the, the Tokyo office will meet you on the first night or the second night, maybe take you for dinner and uh, kind of welcome you to Tokyo. And then you've got two weeks to do a little bit of exploring, but also to find your accommodation. And um, depending on where you want to live, and I think um, I won't focus too much on that now because um, we could talk, I could talk for hours about that really. Um, but you can speak with previous scholars and alumni. So if, if you're accepted onto the program, uh, you have the network of scholars to talk to and to ask for advice. Um, so when you are thinking about where you want to live, make the most of that. You can ask us on um, recommendations for where to live. Um, but yeah, depending on where you decide you want to live, whether you want to be close to university or whether there's a specific part of Tokyo that you think is beautiful, or if you're thinking ahead and want to live near to where your work placement might be. Um, your probably the cost of your living and stuff will be different. So for those two weeks, it's it's a really good time to explore different parts of Tokyo um, <coughs> and find, yeah, find somewhere where you want to live. The stipend that you get as, as a scholar is um, is generous. So um, 
I don't you, I wouldn't worry about uh, the costs of living in Tokyo, just to quell any anyone's fears about that. And um, the foundation generally asks that you find a flat for yourself. So we so we don't live in homestays. Uh, we have a flat. Um, yeah, for ourselves. Um, and like I said, the, the stipend more than covers that. Um, so you can either find accommodation with the Wasada Accommodation Centre, so that's part of the university. And I think the year below, the year after me, so DS19, I think most of them, like maybe um, maybe all of them, found their accommodation with this Wasada Accommodation Centre. My year, for whatever reason, we didn't like as much the flats that they showed us that year. Um, so we, a lot of us found accommodation separately with private, um, <coughs> excuse me, private estate agents. But with the help of the Tokyo office as well. But as I said, yeah, the, the alumni generally are more than happy to help you with both accommodation, um, uh, what's the word, queries, and also helping to find somewhere. So then once you've got your accommodation sorted, it's time to start your Japanese classes um, at Waseda. And oops, um, there's sort of two main goals for this. So initially is to get um, your Japanese language to like a good enough level that obviously you can communicate and things but ultimately the, the aim of the program is to pass this JLPT level two so some of you may be aware of the JLPT system it's five different levels of Japanese uh, language ability it's a proficiency test it's a Japanese language proficiency, proficiency test and it's sort of the global um, standard for Japanese uh, indicating your level of Japanese um, it's a written exam there's no speak spoken element to it but yeah, it's the standard really. So um, it starts at level five, level five and gets harder as you go up down to level one. And JLPT level N2 um, is challenging to, to, to study Japanese and get to level N2 within a year um, or just over a year because the I think the language test is in December. Um, so you would have just over a year to get to that level. It is a challenge, um, but it is achievable as well. So just be aware that it's... Um, it isn't a walk in the park, let's say. Like learning Japanese is really good fun and especially learning it in Tokyo because you can practice it and it's really rewarding to use it on every day. Um, at the same time, it is a challenging language um, and you are expected to attend uh, your classes and to make progress as you go along. So the, the study is split into, um, I think the first year you're at Waseda, so you attend um, as a normal Waseda student, let's say you attend the academic year. I'll, I'll show you the, uh, the schedule in a second. And then once you've graduated from Waseda and you've you've actually started your um, placement as part of the Daiwa program, you will then be taking evening classes at Waseda and I think on the weekend as well um, to prepare you for the JLPT test. Because as I said, that's in oops, that's in December. So once you've graduated from Waseda, you'll still be going a couple of times a week until December um to prepare you for the language test um and i should say actually the jlpt it's one of those um you might have a really good level of japanese but at the same time you need to practice the the examination system um so it's good to have these um preparatory uh lessons at waseda in the, in the evenings to get familiar with the type of questions that you'll be asked in the exam um yeah it's really useful to have those so um, the yeah, so the initial 12 months you'll be studying at Waseda University. And like I said, it is an intense program, but it's really enjoyable. And you can tailor the, the sort of style of classes to suit your learning style, let's say, or your interests. So um, classes are from Monday to Saturday um, and they run from nine to 6 p.m. Each class is 90 minutes. And depending on your level, you'll have an element of choice in the lessons that you choose. So at the beginning, um, obviously, you need to get a basic level of Japanese grammar and kanji. So there are some compulsory classes that you need to take. Um, but then you have the ability to choose, I think, two or three of the classes at the beginning, um, which are sort of like they're still compulsory, but you have a, you have you have options on what you choose. So they might be you might decide to learn. Um, for example, everyday expressions through Japanese manga, or you might learn, or you might choose to learn Japanese uh, business um, phrases 
through um, sort of spoken language classes. So you can decide um, a little bit on the emphasis that you have in your in your classes. And if you have any questions about that, feel free to put them in the chat, <laughs> excuse me, or ask at the end. Um, so yes, uh, this point here about the Japanese level test. So when you arrive in, when we arrive in Tokyo at the end of September, I think it is, you take a test at Waseda and that will determine what class you start at. And that will be your class, that will be your language level throughout the first term. And depending on your progress, um, you might move up one class, or you might make, you might move up one or two levels at the end of that first term uh, into the second term. Um, and yes, so you can take classes from different faculties. Uh, so for example, I took a judo class with the sports facility um, and that was mixed with Japanese students. So the, the language classes, which will be your main nine to 6 p.m. classes are with other Daiwa scholars and also international students from all around the world, which is really uh, amazing. It's a really nice cultural kind of exchange. Um, but you can also take classes from other faculties, like it says here, as long as it fits into your timetable. Um, so I think you can take sort of humanities, like I took a sports class, and those lessons are, you'll be mixed with Japanese students. Um, and then this final point is really important, um, <coughs> both for the scholarship itself, for the Daira Foundation, but also um, to pass the programme at Waseda, you need a certain level of attendance. Um, and I think that, yeah, there's a register in each class. So it's really, really important that you attend class. Uh, and if there's any reason that you can't make class, let the Tokyo office know. Um, it's absolutely fine if you're ill or, you know, if there's an emergency that comes up. But generally, the language aspect of the uh, scholarship is really, really important. And it, it's really emphasised that you attend class and that you make progress in the language. Um, so that's just important to emphasise. So, yes, like I said, um, well, I'm not sure if I said this actually, but um, there's two terms a year at Waseda. Um, there are, although it is quite an intense course, um, and you might have lessons on Saturday, depending on what level you're in or what classes you choose, <laughs> it will only be Saturday morning, but um, there are also lots of national holidays in Japan. So as you can see, um, there's all different festivals that are written here, like Waseda Festival, which is a university festival, um, well, that's on the weekend, and then there's all different kinds of national festivals and you will have those will be holidays um so you do get time off uh even in term time you'll get a couple of days off and um so you'll be arriving september so the second slot is when you'll start um i'm not sure if everyone's aware but generally in japan the academic year starts in april uh so it's sort of different to here um and then the second term starts in september whereas we'll be starting in the second term um <laughs> And then you have a month off from February to March um, before you start a second term. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, yep. Okay, and then I'm going to hand over now to Fran to talk a little bit about the homestay aspect of the programme and also about the work placement. Uh, hi everyone. Yeah, uh, Dara's gone from 2015. And um, just before I do that, I thought I might just pick up on a couple of questions in the chat. Susan's doing a brilliant job at answering, but there's a few just uh, linked to what we were talking about. Uh, so the study programme it is full time, uh, and you you wouldn't be doing a part time job at the same time because actually you're not really meant to on the visa that you're given for this scholarship. But you are provided a monthly stipend that will cover your living expenses. Uh, and as Aileen was saying, there are holidays, so there are chances to travel to Japan and also to come back to the UK if you wanted. Um, there are no classes in those first two weeks when you first settle in um, in Tokyo. So just while you're getting used to everything. And um, yeah, I think the rest of the things Susan's picked up on. Also with the JLPT exams, uh, there are you can get extra time if you are uh, eligible for extra time because of, of whatever needs you have, if it's uh, due to dyslexia or so on, it's just something you need to talk to the scholars of the office or with Waster about. Um, yeah, cool. Okay, so I'll talk about the homestay. So it's one month, uh, you can go pretty much anywhere you want in Japan and most scholars say this is a highlight of the program for them. It's a, a really fantastic experience. So the 
office will ask you to rank three places in Japan that you're interested in going to. Uh, and you can also say what it is you're interested in getting out of the scholarship. Um, so I can give you an example just from my personal experience. So I'm in the bottom left there uh, in front of this massive taiko drum. So I wanted to go to Sado Island because they there are lots of traditional art forms that are alive there. And also I really like to be, I just wanted to be in nature after being in, in Tokyo for a year. So you put down your preferences in the office, try and connect you with families by going through local councils and so on to see who's interested in hosting uh, a homestay uh, and uh, you're not meant to speak English on your homestay it's meant to be really immersive um, some families maybe want to speak English with you a bit but they understand they'll, they'll speak Japanese with you all the time you'll learn some of the local dialect uh, and you'll you all your meals are provided and you eat with the family, so you get some local fare, you get to learn local cooking if that's something you're interested in. Um, and a lot of families, they'll do various things, they'll include you in their various interests. So I know there, there's a family in Okinawa who build their own canoes in a traditional way and then they do boat trips. So if you wanted to get involved, you can go out and do that. Or there's or there's other ones with their hobbies are, are surfing or um um, or like um, specific craft making so you can get involved with this as well if you show that you're you know open and, and engaged and they're so curious I want to learn about you if you've got any dietary requirements or uh, any accessibility requirements you communicate these to the Japan office when you're talking about where you'd like to go um, and they do their best to accommodate all of that no problem uh, yeah, so it's, and it's also a fantastic time to base yourself somewhere and then you can travel around there and see a totally different side of Japan. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so at the work placement, you do your homestay and then you generally come back to Tokyo to embark on your six month work placement. So this kind of looks different for every scholar because there's so many different disciplines who apply. And it's really, really important to be proactive. That is the main thing. I'd say there's, there, there isn't like a list of places that you can just be slotted into. So whilst you're, when you're writing your application, it's really good to have an idea of what you would want to do. So it could be that you would like to work in the research department of a university say you don't have to know the specific university you want to study at necessarily when you're doing applications but just show that you've got a clear idea of you know you can see how it's moving forward and a clear idea of what you'd like to do in your placement then you communicate this with the tokyo office and they're really well connected and they can help introduce you to the right people and and find the right place for you and if your aims kind of change whilst you're on the scholarship, just also you know, communicate that with the office and they will be accommodating. Uh, you, you will never get placed somewhere without being consulted. Like, um, so yeah, I would say in general, a really important thing to do is whilst you're studying, you know, in that first 12 month program, just go out, go and attend events, go and try and get to networking uh, events, go and see things, go and meet people. Um, and Di Diary will facilitate that a little bit, but you really make the most of your time to make those some of those connections then. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a few examples of some of the work placements that past scholars have done. So. I mean, they're pretty diverse. Uh, so we've had, there's obviously quite a lot of scientists, uh, quite a lot of people involved in, well, aerodynamics, and, but also to like, interests in nuclear science. Um, there's, so there's, there's quite a few involved in, interested in sustainable energy and, and different practices there. So you can go to various companies or university research departments. Uh, then there's, there's also a lot of artists, uh, so visual artists or art historians, but also performers. Um, 
do occasionally. So, so I was music and there was someone else on my scholarship who's a theatre director. Um, so there's the scope for getting involved with venues and museums and galleries as well. And yeah, and it's possible to do, as Aileen was saying, it's possible to do one for three months and then another one for three months. Or um, if, in my case, they were both quite part time, so I did two concurrently. Uh, and also in re more, and more and more in recent years, people haven't been coming back to Tokyo, they've been going somewhere else in Japan. So for example, there's somebody at the moment who's uh, involved in metal work and there was a specific place in Northern Japan that she wanted to do that, so she's gone there. Uh, there was somebody who was doing a placement, a sword museum, which was um, more in Southern Japan. So there is, if there's a specific place where you want to do your work placement, it's not in Japan, that is possible. Uh, and the ones in green there are the ones that our 2019 scholars um, had completed. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, and then at the end of your work placement, you finally graduate. Uh, Dai will hold a graduation ceremony for you in the center of Tokyo. Uh, you prepare a little speech um, and don't worry, there's this coaching and support <laughs> uh, available for that because it is quite daunting doing like a little five minute speech in Japanese, but everybody does it. Uh, and uh, and and yeah, and then you're provided with a buffet and and there's lots of. Yeah, it's just really joyous. It's really nice. And sometimes homestay families, they're always invited homestay families and work placement colleagues are invited and those who can attend will. Uh, next slide, please. So the Daiwa Scholars 2019, the majority of whom are actually still in Japan, uh, you can get a little idea of the diversity of their disciplines and interests here. And it was out of this group as well, I know quite a few did their work placements outside of Japan. So Kathleen, Kathleen yep, she did her work place at silversmithing and jewellery up in Scuba, no, not Scuba, sorry, Subama up uh, in Niigata Prefecture, yeah, and you can see Simi did her homestay in Kagoshima, but then she did ceramics in Mito Kiln, which is actually in Kyushu, it's also the south of Japan. Um, yeah, quite a broad, you can see there are, when it comes to universities, because there's already a, a strong connection there, it can maybe be quite easy to set up a work placement there, but still it, it's, it's worth thinking about quite early on. Uh, yeah. And this is Eileen's year. Maybe we should let Eileen talk about this. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so you can see actually there's quite a lot of uh, scientists. Well, yeah, there's a couple of us from Imperial in my year, um, which is sometimes the way that the cookie crumbles. But um, yeah, out of my year, Joe and Graham are still in Japan. Uh, I'm hoping to go back sort of for some research at some point. I'm still in science. Um, but yeah, we had quite a strange year because we finished up just as the pandemic was starting. Um, not a strange year, we had a strange graduation, I should say. Um, so we didn't have any friends and family there. We didn't have any homestay family, um, unfortunately, but they all got sent the DVD of our speeches. So <laughs> it's recorded forever for them to watch. Um, and yeah, so my year, we also did um, homestays and placements all over. So two, two of my year went down to Okinawa, both Enzo and Alba. Um, which I'm sure many of you know is the southernmost um, island. Uh, it's got quite a different culture to mainland or to, to, to the main, um, the four main islands in Japan. Um, so it's quite an interesting place to visit. And yeah, it's got quite a different culture and language historically. Um, and also, to be honest, even myself and Graham and Miyazaki, um, so this, this is also quite far south in, in Japan, um, it has quite a different dialect as well. And that's what that's one thing that's really fun about the homestays is unless you're kind of quite close to Tokyo or if you're in Hokkaido, which is famously, I think, has quite a similar dialect to Tokyo, um, other regions of Japan have really different dialects. And it's really fun to learn like the kind of local slang. Um, so in Miyazaki, if you're kind of saying that you're really tired or you're emphasizing something, um, you say like Honjata and you'd never say that in Tokyo. It doesn't make any sense in Tokyo but yeah it's fun to learn that kind of thing and then you can see so in the middle in the purple is our homestays and then on the right are our um 
work placements and you can see there's just a broad range depending on your career goals um so yeah a couple of, a couple of us of us did multiple homes uh work placements as well um i'll go back to fran then oh, thanks um yeah as you can see there's a really uh wide list of employers for when people come back um from japan uh yeah it really it really does open up your career possibilities which are to really just stand out on cvs and it's just quite a formative time and um, we're having 19 months in japan you definitely have the opportunity to find new career paths or new interests that you might develop into something new so yeah everyone from BBC News here and to yeah I mean you can you can look through the list they're not all Japan related companies and so on it's um definitely get transferable skills yeah next slide please actually could I quickly just say Fran yeah. um just to reassure people you mentioned already about if you have a dietary requirement on the homestay hmm. um I'm vegan and I was vegan mostly vegan <laughs> throughout my time in Japan but um whenever I wasn't it was by choice um so I might have eaten fish occasionally but the homestay yeah the Tokyo office will make sure that your family know what your requirements are um so if anyone here does have dietary requirements please be assured that they will be listened to yeah 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 I was the same vegetarian and yeah they once they get their head around it they're like oh yeah cool that's fine <laughs> um yeah life beyond the scholarship so these there are a few examples of people who did the scholarship in its earlier days, so um, a few years ago. And yeah, as you may, when you read through the criteria for applying, one of the things it says is Daira are looking for people who will go on to be leaders in their field in the future. And you can see that that is the case uh, with you know, directors and um, you know, heads of department and so on. Um, don't think that like, oh gosh, I'm going to have to be, you know, a leader in my field as soon as I finish the scholarship. I mean, it's, it's, it's not quite, you know, there's no pressure, but it is, they want to support people who have got goals and aims, essentially. Uh, James Brown is very much still in Tokyo and um, that's something to say as well as there's direct scholars keep in touch uh, whether it's uh, there is a Facebook group for scholars still in Tokyo so you can you can message on there and like if you were to go out the, there is support on a on a kind of like friendly level as well um, quite a lot of scholars will even like pass on their furniture and so on um, the, the the scholars from the years above generally when you you know when they arrive in those first two weeks and you're staying in the hotel and everything's a bit um, discombobulating uh, the the other scholars will generally take you out for dinner and and yeah there's there's a really nice communal feel between scholars yeah uh, next slide so yeah, so let's just talk about the criteria. So it's only open to British citizens aged between 21 and 35 as of September. Uh, you do need to have graduated a um, bachelor's or master's or PhD, as, um, must have graduated from university before embarking on the scholarship. Uh, and as I was saying before, um, if you study Japanese at university, you wouldn't be eligible for this scholarship, but there is a different scholarship which you could apply for the um, specific Dao scholarship in Japanese studies. Uh, you must have clear career objectives. As I said, they're looking for people who are gonna go on to be leaders in their field. Um, you must show how going to Japan and studying Japanese, immersing yourself in Japanese culture is gonna be beneficial to your career and how it links to your career goals. Um, but you don't need to, it doesn't matter if you've never been to Japan. I'd never been to Japan um, before I went, but I could show that it was um, my strong interest in Japanese traditional music as someone was influencing my work and I wanted to collaborate with Japanese musicians. So, it, it, and then, move forward in my career so even though i'd never been i could show that going would be really important uh, as i develop my career and there's quite a few people but in recent years a few people have done uh, japanese night courses and so on so it doesn't 
necessarily give you an edge. Um, so don't worry if if you've never been before or not studied the language before. Uh, yeah. It's cool. So it's it's quite a long application process. Uh, there's three stages. So so first you you complete the application form, which is available on the website, and there'll be a link at the end in case you've um, not seen this yet. Uh, so you complete the form and submit it, and then in stage one, the first shortlisted candidates will be invited for an interview. This is normally done in person, and they're planning to do it in person as well for um, in uh, 2022. But of course, it's corona dependent, and um, and if there are some people who are currently abroad, there might be an option to to do this on Zoom. And then, out of the it's so usually about twenty seven candidates who make it stage one, they'll be shortlisted again, and some will be invited to the second stage of interviews. Uh, this is when you do a language aptitude test. So it is not a test on a specific language or a specific foreign language, but it's a test on how you would learn a language. Um, it's, it's kind of more of like a logic test in some ways and, show, and it tests whether you can spot patterns in made up languages. So nobody would have a um, like an advantage if they were fluent in, in one particular language or something. Uh, and there's also a lunch where you can ask questions of from previous scholars who sometimes attend um, a bit more informally and get to know the office staff as well. Uh, and then that's narrowed down again. And then for stage three is the, the final interview with the trustees. Um, yeah, and then the results are announced shortly afterwards. So as you can see, it does take a couple of months from if you're applying in December, and if you were to go through all the stages, you would know by late March, early April, if you've been successful in the scholarship. So yeah, uh, in general, all interviews take place at Daira Foundation, Japan House in London, and in the Regent's Park area. Uh, all candidates are notified by letter or email. Uh, Yes, and something, oh, maybe I should just say with the application process, just to let you know, when you apply and do the form, you also need to have three referees uh, send in a reference for you. And you can do that now by email, but they have to email Daiwa directly and not sent to you and then forwarded. Yeah, and yeah, once you've, once you've been notified in about April, then there's a slight gap and before you start the EG, EJEF course in High Wycombe in late July or early August. And then all being well, yeah, departing for Tokyo in September 2022. So it is, it is a very generous scholarship. Uh, all tuition fees at Waseda are covered in the scholarship. You are given a maintenance grant, which you can it can live very comfortably uh, off in Tokyo. Uh, it is yeah, it's a living cost for a single person, but there is no reason why you 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 can move out with a partner, um, and you you can if you find accommodation, you can both live there, and you can use your maintenance grant to cover that accommodation. There's no problem with that. Uh, and the travel, yes, you get in, uh, not one way, the opposite, return ticket <laughs> uh, covered by the scholarship as well. Um, you don't have to book your return ticket uh, when you're going out because you might want to stay there for longer. I mean, I, I certainly did. Um, then you can just get the, you can move that to another time. So the accommodation for the first two weeks when you arrive is also provided for by Daiwa. And um, there's also insurance that, uh, yes, yeah, so your, your private medical insurance uh, while you're on the program, um, but you will also pay into the Japanese national health insurance system. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's quite low, it's quite a small bill um, each month. 
or every other month actually um, and that just means that when you go to any doctors or, or hospitals or anything you just you only pay 30 percent of the the um the fees so it's, it's not quite a national health system like it is in the uk but it is it is quite cheap yeah um, so what makes a good application well, i guess because there's so many different disciplines uh welcomed to the scholarship and uh, it's there's not really a one size fits all the the strongest thing to do is really show how your clear interest in japan is linked to your career goals um be really really clear about you know it, it, if you look like you kind of just want to go to japan on a jolly for a year then it's <laughs> you're, not, you're not going to um and, and if it's a reasonably new interest that you've developed then that's fine but then you you just have to show why it's really well um worthwhile pursuing that and um and being able to back up what you say so if you can show any evidence uh that it doesn't mean that you've been going to japanese language classes but that could be it that could be one aspect maybe you, yeah so maybe you've gone to classes or maybe you've done some research in this topic or maybe you uh, took part in a society or something at university um or you you know you've been studying the sports or, or musical instrument or, or something that's within japanese culture um if you if you say you'd really like anime but your career isn't something that's very very different and that you haven't shown that your career really would benefit by going to japan it's more which kind of a personal hobby or something then that would look a bit weaker compared to someone who can kind of marry the two i would say um would you like to add anything Hey. Yeah, I think you're spot on that with that with that last comment. I was going to say, um, yeah, you the, the the strongest applications are ones, yeah, that that show both a, a professional and personal interest in Japan. And although it says sort of avoid cliches, if if in a way you are a cliche, like the kind of cliche that you really like manga and anime, that's absolutely fine as long as you make it clear on your application that is that how that's relevant to you personally. Um, <laughs> Another and like another example might be that you're really into robotics and you also want to study like mechanical or electronic engineering out there. Um, that would show how you've married both your hobby and your career into into a strong application. Um, but yeah, I think the the main thing is to make it personal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and you know just to touch on the other aspects that Dara are looking for as well. They they want to support future leaders. So if you can show any evidence of you taking the initiative, maybe you've started up a project or something, or maybe you you took a, a leading role in a society or um or in your work, in your in employment, uh, if you can show any professional development opportunities you've taken part in, that would be really great. Um, if you can show be i guess be careful with your i say be careful just choose your references wisely because uh, a reference here is going to be really glowing um is obviously going to stand out uh, opposed to a reference that's going to be quite standard and a bit average um and you do need to get three um so yeah just maybe just have a little think about who you would ask um and yeah uh, like I was saying before just have a little think about where you'd want to do your work placement and it doesn't need to be a long paragraph but just show that you've thought about this and that you've got some ideas so that when you turn up to Japan you can talk to the Japan office and and have somewhere to run with yeah yeah um another thing I just thought of as you were talking Fran was um uh say you haven't been to Japan before um I think you still want to demonstrate that you would settle in okay so that you'd mm. obviously there is anyone who who moves out that there'll be a, a culture an aspect of cultural shock or culture shock um whether you've been there before or not um but yeah just being able to demonstrate that you'll be able to sort of a deal with that and be sort of like grow from that really mm. um so any experiences that you've had today even just um at home that you can demonstrate um like learning about different cultures would make your application stronger as well. 
Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I guess that's quite an obvious point in a way, but like, yeah, just showing that you're open to other cultures and that you're interested and you're, um, yeah, quite broad minded. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cool. So let's go through some of these frequently asked questions and then, yeah, and if anybody would like to raise their hand, and Susan's doing a great job of answering questions in the chat, but if you'd like to raise your hand and ask a question in person as well, that would be great. Um, so FAQs, those with tattoos be considered? Yes, uh, they do have. Yeah, scholars with tattoos have been welcomed onto the scholarship before the the only thing to be aware of is some of the onsens of the, these are the natural spas and the hot springs sometimes they don't let people in uh if they've got visible tattoos but other and and perhaps for work placements you might need to wear like a long shirt or something to cover things but in general i don't think it's much of a problem uh do you want to do the next one Maybe? Yeah, yeah. So um, we had this question: Were those not maintaining a minimum GPA, so a minimum mm. level that was be struck off the scholarship? Um, and I sort of mentioned this before, but um, it is challenging to learn Japanese to the high, to the high level that you will in in the year or so. Um, and if you're having problems, that's or if you're finding it challenging, that's absolutely fine and it's quite normal as long as you are in regular communication with the Tokyo office. Um, they'll be contacting you all the time anyway with different events and sort of advice and stuff. So as long as you're in regular communication back with them, that's fine. Um, however, if you are absent without sort of any reason um, or maybe if you neglect your studies, that that looks really bad and you may be recalled from the scholarship. Hmm. Another question is about, uh, will having done Japanese at extracurricular level count against your application? And we'd say no um people have done night courses before or a module within their university degree um perhaps and that's fine but it is meant to be a learning opportunity so um yes in general not too advanced so if you've if you have started doing jlpd exams with the m5 sure that's fine but m4 maybe we're starting to get a bit too detailed so yeah hope that helps Um, so should I take the next one? Yeah, yeah. One week. Um, yeah. So again, yeah, Fran's kind of covered this already, but um, oh, I think my camera's off. Um, so how are placements found? Yeah, the, the onus really is on the scholar to to choose a placement and to find one that you're really interested in. Um, but since there is quite a uh, a long history now of the scholarships, we do have a good alumni network, um, mm -hmm. and both the scholar themselves and the Tokyo office can use that. Um, like I think Fran said, particularly for universities, it's we have quite a good network now. Um, but yeah, really be proactive. You have when you first start at Waseda, you'll have like a, you'll fill in a little, you'll fill in both your home save preference form and you'll fill in a work placement uh, idea kind of form. And the Tokyo office will then sort of start looking for you. But if you can start networking, whether it's at Waseda, whether it's um, sort of going to events, you can kind of find events like on Eventbrite and stuff like you have in the UK, you have them in Tokyo and you can go mm -hmm. and meet people from different industries. Like if there's an event on like AI or something. Um, so kind of the same as what you would do here, just network um, and find something which you're interested in. Um, but yeah, uh, I think having an idea of what you want to do is the main thing, because then you can then go after that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I guess I would say, yeah, it's it's not like you have to have a specific person necessarily. Um, for example, I said I would like to work with a music therapist, but I didn't know any Japanese music therapists before I went. But then just during the time while I was there, I managed to 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 meet a couple. And then I spoke to the, the to the Jap Japan office and was like, oh, maybe we can go and meet them and try and set up something formal. And that's how it went. So, yeah. So don't worry, you don't need to have like their name and address before you go. Uh, any advice for PhD students who want to apply? Yeah, PhD students are also most welcome. Um, yeah, it's, it's the strength of the application that the, as long as you have graduated from university, um, in some ways, it doesn't matter about your level of education, whether it's uh, you had a bachelor's, a master's or a PhD, or even if you're in your PhD, um, 
you know, you can, yeah, it's the strength of your application that will be considered most, not the level of education. Yep, and another one that we've sort of covered already, but just to emphasize, um, so how are scholars match with their homestay family? Uh, yeah, you fill in a, a, a place, like location preference form, uh, and you like only send that to the Daiwa office once you're in Tokyo. And depending on, yeah, it could be a cultural reason that you want to stay somewhere, or it could be a particular family that you want to stay with. I think one of our scholars previously stayed with, was it a sumo? I'm going to get this wrong, but it might be an sumo or a sort of um, a judo family. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it really depends. So for me, for example, I, I did two homestays, both in Miyazaki. And essentially I wanted to, to surf, to go surfing for a month and also to see like a part of Southern Japan um unfortunately Miyazaki is actually although it's far south it's very overcast and cloudy <laughs> so that wasn't what I expected but I had a great time um so yeah it really depends on your cultural I suppose your personal um preferences but I'd say it's a good opportunity that one month to, to see a completely different side of Japan um some people I think do decide to stay near Tokyo um which is absolutely fine if that's what you, you want to do mm. um but I'd say take the opportunity to see something different um mm -hmm. and yeah oh and then I'll do this last one as well actually because yes. it's about Waseda so um yes yeah, so the question is do scholars have a personal tutor or mentor at Waseda and yes you will so uh for example in my year there were two of the um teachers at, at the language center um assigned to us scholars um and we had a, a meeting once a week with that tutor I think it was half an hour might have been an hour um, and you can use that meeting however you like, whether it's just to have a, a casual catch up and like a kind of pastoral session, that's fine. Or if you want to use it as like a lesson and ask them about grammar or something, that's also fine. But um, yeah, you do have a regular contact, a, reg a personal tutor who you regularly contact, I want to say that. And they will also be a teacher. Um, so you might, they might even teach you in one of your classes as well. And they're, they're lovely. Um, yeah. Great. So should we... Um... Yeah, let's uh, go to a few questions from people who have raised their hands. So Hina Rana, yeah. would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Hi, hi both. Thank you so much for delivering this talk. It's been really informative. Um, I have two questions. Um, my first is, I know you mentioned briefly about um, the application stage and how it differs depending on who applies, but I was wondering what you both think you did well and that stood out um, for the people who are reviewing and maybe you found out later that oh this was this was really um, informative and useful and sort of made you stand out from other applicants and my second question is it's a bit personal so feel free to not answer it but what is your current Japanese language level um, since you both completed the program? Oh, thanks, Hina. Um, do you want to? No? <laughs> Shall yeah, I, um, <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll first. Um, so with the application stage, what stood out? I think, I think what stood out is maybe I'd come, I'd show that I'd come to a realization that I now needed to go to Japan and that I was committed to following through so by that I mean so I'm a composer so I write music and I'd realized in the past few years um, I'd been listening to loads of Japanese instruments and, and, and reading and about aesthetics and so on and it was influencing the music I was writing and I really wanted to engage with Japanese musicians but I'd never been to Japan and I hadn't learned the language and I thought you know what I really need to try and do this seriously so I, I don't end up pastiching this culture or just being influenced from afar. So I think I showed that I'd shown some awareness of my own professional development and then said, so if I go to Japan, I will be proactive. I think I also show that by um, meeting Japanese musicians and taking part in and playing in ensembles. And I really wanted to study Japanese instruments so, and I wanted to study as many as I, as, as I could. Uh, so it showed that I would engage not only with Japanese language teachers, but also with teachers of the culture. Um, and I think that maybe also showed that uh, I was going to engage with Japanese culture on 
different levels and also not just traditional but contemporary because I wanted to meet Japanese composers who were also writing new music with um, players of traditional instruments so that's, that's all maybe quite it's quite specific within my music field uh, but I I think that was maybe the main things I've shown awareness of my own professional development I showed clearly how committed I was to going to Japan and how clearly going was going to help me develop um, and I've shown that I was proactive and I was going to go out and network and meet people and my current language level I was I did get to the N2 level when I was on the scholarship uh, and then I lived in Japan for a further four years I only came back this year so I'd say yeah I, I'm pretty good <laughs> I don't know. like I'd, I'd say it was sort of N2 but that is technically business level and I always say it depends what business you want me to do because <laughs> you want to put me in charge of like import export but um but then I've yeah and I've I've definitely learned so much from the homestay family and staying in touch with them and making Japanese friends and and so on so um, and then working um, in Japanese. So yeah, I think it's probably important. Any? Yep, yeah, so um, for me, the application stand up. So actually it's quite interesting, me and Fran have quite different applications, both um, in terms of we own different industries, so I'm a scientist, but also I had been to Japan um, twice before I went uh, and I had some level of Japanese. Um, so you can see that whether or not, so, I, so basically I went out to Japan on a, during a gap year, um, <coughs> Uh, and I, yeah, I'd been interested in Japan um, from a young age and learning Japanese actually from a young age, although I kind of stopped and started. So my level <laughs> wasn't wasn't amazing at the time. Um, but yeah, in terms of my application, so I had established, I had like a established interest in the language. Um, but I think what made my application strong, again, is, is tying in the professional aspect. Um, so as I say, I'm a scientist and um, I'm sure you are well aware, but like, Japan is very strong um, in various different sciences, but I initially wanted to go out and study food chemistry um, for a variety of reasons. I ended up sort of doing a placement at a, actually at a vegan non-for-profit. So there's a kind of food element to that, but it was a little bit different. And then I did a placement in a, like a kind of biological chemistry lab. Um, slightly different from my initial sort of thoughts, which in a way is a good example, because if your career goals change somewhat during your, I mean, when you apply, I think a lot of us are quite young, um, particularly if you're fresh from university. So your career goals might change a little bit. Um, but I think what made my application strong was that I had a clear link between um, my career goals, which were researching food chemistry and um, why Japan would be a good place for that. So, for example, Japan's got a real history of um, pioneering food chemistry. For example, like even the, the, four, the fifth taste, umami, is a Japanese word, right? Um, and there's various other... Yeah, reasons why Japan was a le is a leader in food chemistry. So I think harnessing both that and my personal interest and then sort of uh, leading on from what Fran was saying before as well about trying to um, get scholars who are going to be leaders in the future. Um, if you can harness something which is strong about yourself and also strong about Japan, I think that makes a really strong application. Um, I, I would say actually... <laughs> I'll put my email in the chat. I haven't opened the chat, sorry, yet because I'm aware there might be some private messages and I don't want to, um, or there might be some direct messages and I don't want to show them on the main screen. But I'll send my email in the chat. Um, and if you have any uh, questions that you want to ask as a follow up, feel free to send them to my email. Um, in terms of my Japanese level, so I, 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 I was a recent scholar, so I graduated in just as Corona was hitting. So it would have been March 2020. Um, and I was hoping to stay out there, but I also was scared about not seeing my family with Corona. Um, I didn't know how long it was going to go on. So I came back. Um, uh, so I've had about a year of not speaking it on the regular, but I'm still able. So my one of my homestay families I'm regularly in contact with and we chat in Japanese on Facebook. Um, and I'm also still I'm doing like some work for the Japanese professor that I was with in Japan um, in terms of like proofreading language stuff um and like yeah I, I read sort of Japanese news semi-regularly <laughs> um I think the Franz level was probably better than mine but nonetheless I'm very confident still in speaking Japanese on the daily I I can give presentations in Japanese uh, on science or 
with a bit more preparation on maybe some other topics. Um, so yeah, I think it really depends on your motivation, to be honest, whether you, A, what level you get to, and B, whether you pass. So I passed the end two as well. I think that really, really depends on how much you're motivated. Because you might put in, you might have loads of motivation at the beginning um, and then sort of get distracted along the way. And it is, to be honest, it's a long, it's a long process um, getting from start to finish. Um, so just reminding yourself along the way why you're there, why you're interested. Um, and if that means sort of finding new ways to become interested in the language, um, by all means, follow those as well. Hopefully that helps. Um, and then maybe- Thank we you so help. much. Yeah, no worries. Um, Thank you. Should we ask Ruby? Is she next? Yeah, yeah. Hi, so my question was more about the actual format of the application. I'm not sure if it's been updated, but when I looked on the website, I didn't see anything like a form or a link to saying how many words it had to be or anything to do with that and whether the references were included as part of that application or whether they were sent separately. So I wondered how that worked. Thanks. Okay, normally there is like a, uh, there's a specific page for the scholars <coughs> for each year. Um, and it's like, it's like a formal application form that you fill in. Um, so that we'll see if we can get a link sent through to you mm -hmm. on that. And the reference systems, again, in the application form, it stipulates the kind of uh, form that the references should take. Um, again, there's a little bit of changes this year because of, and I think last year because of Corona, um, that uh, references are now accepted by email where it used, it used to be, um, it used to have to be by post. But um, yeah, we will see if we can send through uh, a link, that might be on the chat, a link to the this year's application. I might just stop um, sharing my screen so that I can open the chat as well. Oh yeah, I've just put our emails in there as well. Um, hmm. um, would Giovanna like to ask a question? Yes, hi, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really, really informative. Um, and I was just wondering, like, I'm, I'm sure it's like fine, but like, I was wondering if at any point or if you've heard anything like during COVID about like if at any point you kind of felt like a foreigner in Japan or experienced any form of like discrimination and also um, mainly like in terms of finding work or like finding a flat um, and also like I guess within the workplace also like what it's like to like be a woman working as well and Hmm. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I guess I lived, so I only just moved back to the UK um, very late in July this year. So I was there throughout uh, the start of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, I had a job and a flat already, so I didn't need to find a new place. Um, did I feel any... The, I think there have, been, there have been like a couple of times when I've been, I remember I think I was moving some stuff and I had a suitcase and I was on public transport and I felt like then maybe there was some more eyes on me because you look like you're fresh in, but, um, but otherwise, no, in fact, what you used to get a lot is like, oh, you're from Britain, it's really bad there. I was like, yeah. Um, so, which maybe just highlights the fact that even in Tokyo, even in such an enormous metropolis, you are, people will clock you as a, a foreigner. It kind of doesn't matter how long you live there. I mean, I, um, people will ask you, they'll be like, oh, where are you from? Oh, your Japanese is amazing. Like, oh, can you use chopsticks? And I mean, not all the time and obviously not everyone, but um, it's, it, you definitely I feel like you definitely get asked questions more than you would never get asked in London um say um where are you from can you use a knife and fork like it's sort of it, you know it, it can use chopsticks even like you know um so but it's it's driven by curiosity I think um and I, I don't know personally I I, I think Japan is maybe in some ways still reeling from the fact that it was shut for 350 years. I know it opened up in the Meiji year in like 1850, but it's still, there's 
that that's definitely had a huge impact so uh being a woman um well i don't know i think maybe yeah you sometimes encounter just blatant sexism blatant sexist comments and so on and there are things in the news um uh i don't know i was i was doing some teaching um for a music teaching uh, company um so i was i was teaching baby music classes and i think people are like oh she's a woman so she can do that so there were there's certain stereotypes maybe held by some people but then while i was doing that i was as a composer i was running my own project and i i was the composer and director of an opera and i everyone respected me even though i didn't really know i was doing sometimes but like and and so i i don't feel like nobody kind of spoke over me or i think it maybe really depends on what field you're in and who you're meeting um so maybe that's something you can chat about from a science perspective or yeah um actually i'd say from my experience because i had exactly the same fears um i heard a lot about um the sort of gender gap in japan and to be honest it is it is definitely wider than it is here um but in terms of science i felt that when i was this is lab dependent again it depends what lab you end up in but my lab was really sort of um uh equal in the sense that yeah uh, i didn't notice my gender um in any in any it, it, so in my work placement absolutely didn't notice it um actually at the vegan company i worked with my boss was amazing she was a, a female um like startup boss which was really um unusual and we had like lots of business meetings and she was absolutely like smashing it, it was really it was really cool and she's a japanese woman um you had a previous point um so but yeah i suppose being a foreigner in japan um so i suppose yeah on the woman on the woman front <laughs> there are there are sexism i think there, there is casual sexism that you face in tokyo but you do also face it in the uk um I, i'd say it's different in japan um but i'd say also as a foreigner you don't face it as much as japanese women do um it is a little bit different um and then again following up on the foreigner thing um i agree with fan like you might get someone like questions about where you're from and uh why you're in japan and how you can use chopsticks but generally it's it's driven by a inquisitive nature and it's they're asking because they're interested and they're asking because they they want to talk to you and want to get to know about you and your culture um so i'd say that's like a positive thing in a lot of ways although some days you might just want to be left alone but generally it's a positive thing and then i'd say i'm not sure if we've had quite a lot of queer scholars and i think they've had a um totally fine well speaking for experience as well um as a queer person in japan it's it's perfectly um you're accepted and tokyo is a great place to be queer so if that's another concern that anyone has um i wouldn't worry about that oh yeah someone literally just asked that <laughs> great <laughs> yeah and again previous scholars because there's yeah there's um previous scholars are generally very open with each other and um yeah there'll be lots of support from each of their previous experiences and feel confident to reach out i guess yeah uh yeah yeah sorry yeah one more question from abby yeah, hiya. Um, I just want to start by saying a big thank you to Eileen because I'm a vegan as well and I was really nervous that I may just be living on rice for two years. Um, so I'm glad I'm not doing that. Um, but I was just wondering, sort of, I know that the language studying at Waseda is very intense, sort of like nine to six. I was just wondering, how easy is it to have sort of a work-life balance? Sort of there's clubs to join and if you make friends, you want to go out with that. But if you've got sort of hours of classes and then there's homework on top of that how easy is it to sort of fall behind and sort of can you stay on top of things if you try and do both at the same time um so from my personal experience so both myself and joe in my year um i joined the boxing club which basically meant training every day like for like two hours and joe joined the judo club which also meant uh, like an hour or two of training every day so we were able to do that alongside our studies. Um, so hopefully that will reassure you if you choose to do either a sport or um, like another kind of hobby, 
you do have time to do that because we managed to do that alongside our language studies um in terms of the nine to five thing so it is nine to sorry nine to six the hours that you may be in class are nine to six but it won't be every single day so some days you might be you might have a two hour gap in the middle or you might start at 12. um it's just those are the possible the possible hours if that makes sense so you'll have a night you'll have uh each class is 90 minutes and i think you have um i'm trying to think now back to when i did it I, yeah every day is not nine to six you'll have like time off in between and i think especially in term two term one generally uh, because you're kind of more of a beginner level you'll have more compulsory classes and they'll have set times term two generally you have a bit more freedom to choose and you might be able to choose to have saturdays off or you might be able to choose to have you might you might be able to choose your schedule so you have a whole day off in the middle like wednesday off which is then great for doing your laundry and your shopping and stuff um sorry missing in coffee suite um so yeah, and, and then also in terms of not just hobbies, but sort of going away at the weekend and traveling, the stipend is, is generous. So you have enough um, <laughs> money to go on like breaks away and stuff. And um, although you might have class on a Saturday morning, say you can still go away for the rest of Saturday and Sunday. Um, so you might take a, a day trip um, or an overnight trip somewhere. And you, have you, you do have enough time for that. It's just a matter of managing the workload. I think for me personally, I, oh yeah, one thing, um, again, harness the kind of scholar network and ask previous scholars about the classes and say which one has a heavy workload and a light workload, because although it's good to choose classes you're interested in, if you end up choosing like 10 classes that are all really heavy workload, like you are going to be uh, shorter on time than if you spread those out across two terms, for example. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, there's one yeah. question in the chat I was going to maybe pick up on mm. uh, from Nicholas um, <laughs> regarding the differences between studying at Japanese university versus UK university. And like, is, do we need to like adapt or is there any way to adapt? Um, so I would say that it depends what university you study there in the UK. But um, for me, we never had a register in undergrad in the UK, whereas in Japan, there's a register um, and you have to turn up to class. And if you don't, up to a certain percent i think it's 80 percent um you automatically fail um and that's a wasada rule but also in terms of the daira foundation you're expected to go to every class unless you're unwell or have like a, a reason um so for me i think adapting to the the time the need to be there so for me i could do i could do undergrad classes online some of our lectures were online uh, but that wasn't the case at wasada um other than that because we're in the language center you are surrounded by like i sort of mentioned before you're with students all around the world so although you're at a japanese university and you can join like classes for japanese with most japanese students in them and you can join the societies which are very japanese um like the japanese student heavy um your classes themselves are mixed with students who aren't japanese right they're like from all around the world i think typically <laughs> the majority are chinese korean um, and Southeast Asian in, in my experience, uh, but there are, and there's also a lot of people from Norway uh, and Finland, um, but it is a real mix. So I wouldn't say it's a typical Japanese university experience either. Um, it's a Japanese language university experience, if that makes sense. Um, in terms of tips to adapt, I, uh, there's nothing that really comes immediately to mind. So I don't wanna just give you something uh, that I'm making up on the spot. Um, the main thing I'd say is just to keep on top of the workload. Um, but that's more just like a general advice anyway, um, to improve the Japanese. I'd say one thing uh, regarding sort of cultural aspects of it is the, is the club stuff. So like I said, I, I joined the boxing club and <laughs> Joe joined the judo club. I think they, if you join a society or a club, uh, they call it a circle in Japan, but it's the same thing, it's a, it's a club. Um, if you join a club, um, that's a much more kind of, in a way, Japanese experience. Like there generally is a kind of hierarchy and probably the elder students are kind of the ones who are more in charge and the younger students so are less sort of, have less, do, do more of the kind of menial work maybe. Um, but it really depends on the club. But yeah, I think just be aware of hierarchical kind of respect attitudes if you join a club. Um, although again, as a foreigner, you're kind of given leeway generally and you're not expected to know all the cultural 
uh, norms, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then I think Sharifa had a question. Do you like to ask? Hi, yes. Um, so my question is that, um, was the opportunity to practice the language aptitude test um, at the second ah. stage? Yeah, yeah, I just saw that question come up in the chat and I was just <laughs> I was just checking it online. Yes, so the the test is an it's called an MLAT, so M dash L A T. So it's modern language aptitude test. And okay. I think you can look them up. Yeah, I, I've just Googled it. I think you can find um yeah, MLAT preparation, MLAT study. So I think you might be able to do yeah, I'm trying to drag my memory back now. I think you can do a few little simulated tests online, just so you can get you can get a flavour for it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. No problem. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Anything else? Or might be time to. Oh, Devin, do you want to jump in? Uh, hi there. I just had a question regarding um, career path while on the scholarship. Say I was halfway through the scholarship and I, I'm currently in computer programming and I wanted to change to music. I already have experience with that and some education in it. Would it be possible to then get a work experience in a music, um, a musical setting or would I have to kind of stick to my programming uh, degree? Um, I think you, yeah, there is option to change throughout, but I, yeah, if, you, if you're thinking about that now, though, I would definitely put it in um, your application. And there have been a few examples. There was somebody in my year who he did aerodynamics to his undergraduate, and I think he said that that was something he wanted to, to study. He, he was interested in, in JAXA, you know, like sort of Japanese NASA and space program. Um, but then throughout the scholarship, he got more interested in machine learning and, and then went down a kind of AI route and then eventually managed to get a job with, um, well, Amazon and so on. Uh, after a while, that wasn't his work placement, but um, through that. So there is scope um, for that. But I think also if you, if you know now, you maybe want to go somewhere different, but you're just a bit worried that you don't have the experience yet. Perhaps if you can show that's where you'd like to take your career clearly and Japan would allow you to, to do that, it's maybe worth talking about now. Um, somebody has uh, worked in, so obviously my placements were music related and somebody else did work at a record label for their music placement. Um, do you want to add anything, Aileen? Or that pretty much covers it. Yeah, a couple of people in my year switched kind of career goals, um, or maybe not switched, but kind of yeah, refocus a little bit. Um, and it's absolutely possible. I'd say if you're thinking about it now, um, yeah, maybe include that in the application. If that if that's really what you want to do and you know now, then that's what you should put in the application. But if it's something at the back of your mind that you think you might want to switch or integrate later on. Um, that's also possible later on. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, should we take this last question from Rachel and then probably wrap up, I reckon? Yeah, that's right. Thanks, guys. I just wanted to ask, um, do you know if any scholars have gone in the past with families? So I'm aware that people have gone with partners, but do you know if anyone um, have had kids in tow? I don't know of anyone. That might be something to ask Susan. Um, but yeah, people have gone with partners. I'm not sure about children. Do you know anyone, Eileen? I don't know about children, to be honest. Um, None with children. Susan, Susan says not yet, but I don't think that rules you out. Um, Great, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> I'll just quickly say, um, yes, Susan says, yeah, it doesn't rule you out, absolutely not. Um, I'll just quickly address Nicholas's, uh, Nicholas had a question about applying after rejection. Um, there are several scholars who have applied uh, multiple times and got, got a place uh, later on. If you can demonstrate um, 
that you're if you can demonstrate a change between your first application and your second one um like probably the main thing would be progress in your career i think um then you have absolutely every chance of getting it a second time around third time around um potentially say you apply one year and you want to reapply the next year you probably have to have achieved a lot in that one year um but perhaps if you do a master's degree or if you do a grad course of relevance uh, that will show your 